I want to direct your attention to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we've been talking about, uh, this is bibliology, <clears throat> and we'll be dealing with this subject matter for uh, a couple months. Um, we were uh, speaking about some uh, particular things about uh, bibliology over the last couple weeks and definition. You can see in your outline we talked about revelation, and now we're talking about inspiration. And uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, beginning of verse number 16, says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray, and uh, then we'll get with our lesson today. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord. You've blessed us so much by giving us uh, this Lord's Day that we can set apart for worship and for time uh, of fellowshipping together, and particularly for meeting with you. And we ask you, Lord, that you would minister to us uh, throughout this day as we spend some time in your word uh, here in your house. And I pray, Father, that you would um, open up our, our hearts and our minds to truth and that it would have an impact in our lives, that we, especially with this subject matter, Lord, that we'd grow even a greater appreciation uh, for your word. And now, Father, I ask... Uh, for some needs today. I know that uh, attendees are attending a funeral today, and I do pray, Father, that uh, you'd help them to be a blessing and an encouragement to that family, and that uh, whatever transpires, Lord, that would be some tremendous comfort that is uh, uh, given and received. I do pray, Father, for our dear brother DJ Ray, and I pray for him and for his family Lord, that you would comfort them through this time of loss and that, uh, Lord, this, these next few days, I know as Brother DJ said, it's going to be really tough. Um, and I pray you'd help them uh, through this. And, Lord, I just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity of being able to spend some time, although limited amount of time, Lord, with, with Zach. It was good to, to meet him and to spend uh, the time that he had out here in New Jersey um, it's such a blessing uh, to see a family so much in love with each other that they can work through whatever maladies and struggles of the flesh to, um, uh, to build a strong relationship. And just thank you, Lord, for that great example. And I pray, Father, that you'd bless them through this difficult time. Now, Father, teach us. Open up our hearts uh, to the truth. Let your Holy Spirit be at work in our midst and guide us, Lord. Through the word of God, in Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Well, we're talking about, <coughs> excuse me, we're talking about inspiration, and uh, we, uh, we spent a little bit of time talking about um, kind of the background idea of, of inspiration last week, and uh, we talked about revelation, of course, God revealing truth, and not all, not all revelation from God is, has actually been put into the Bible, God has done a lot of things and said a lot of things, uh, but not everything is recorded for us, but there is revelation. And we spoke about this, it's kind of a very important concept and uh, that we spoke about last week, uh, and that is the fact that, you know, we have revelation. Truth is given, and there are some that view that as, as saying, well, now i got to perceive truth, and then, you know, kind of try to define what that truth is. So... Um, but we hold to a doctrine called inspiration. And inspiration, uh, by, if you'll notice there, the meaning of the word itself means God breathed. And so here's revelation, but then it says all scripture is given by inspiration. So revelation is available, and then God, uh, God breathed. In other words, it's a work of God to give this, um, this truth in, in a form where it is now available in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. So the Bible that you have in front of you is not just a perception of truth. You know, people saw, you know, heard or saw the revelation of God and then expressed it in some manner or fashion. Um, but, they, but we hold to the fact that God has given us truth. So it's not a perception. It is actually a process. God gave us truth. So the Bible, now if, um, you know, if we accept this doctrine of inspiration, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, then, um, then truth is something that is given. It is not just something that's perceived. But also the Bible is truth, 
as compared to the Bible just containing truth. And there is a big difference. And there are a lot of folks that sit in pews week after week that hold to this idea that simply the Bible contains truth. And you know, if, 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 if that's where somebody falls, then, then all of a sudden, uh, it's like everything in this, in this book becomes arbitrary as far as is it truth or is it not. So it may be true to you, but it may not be true to me, right? This may be, this may be God speaking to me, or it may just be an historical fact. And so there, there is a <clears throat> this big difference, this, you know, this gulf that's fixed in between perceived truth and given truth. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and so it's God, it's God at work. And so that's a, a, one of the things that we spoke about last week. Um, I have a definition down here. Um, you know, so often I, you know, we're going through um, different things in our. In, in these, in these um, even as we went through the eschatology series, um, you know, there are definitions that pop up. There are technical things to be talked about. Um, you know, Brother Stephen and I were talking about a little bit about that last night after the, uh, after the men's prayer. I don't like to get bogged down in the technicalities and definitions, but it's important uh, that if you're going to understand, you've got to define your terms. It's important that everybody understands exactly what something means. Um, this is, a, uh, uh, this is a definition from a theology work, uh, Erickson. Um, it's, one of the, it's, it's a big one, a big, thick one. I've got a couple copies of it. It's one of those ones I always pick up. Again, I always pick up at used bookstores and give them away if I, if I have an opportunity. Um, Milford? I think his name is Milford. Millard? Millard. Maybe Millard Erickson. It's a supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit upon the Scripture writers. Now, um, a couple things right from the beginning. It, it is supernatural. This is not something that's man-driven, and it is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. We're going to talk about, a little bit more about that uh, probably next, um, the next, uh, next, uh, next, or, or next time we meet with this. I'm going to be out of town next week. I'm going to keep saying next week. I'm not going to be here next week. And uh, Brother Carlos is taking care of the Sunday school class next week. Brother Stephen, now that he's all recovered, is going to be preaching next week. Uh, Mrs. Schroeder and I are going to get away for a few days, head down uh, to lower and slower Delaware uh, to visit some relatives that we don't get to see uh, very often at all. And uh, we're going to be gone for, I don't know, about three or four days. I haven't decided exactly how long we're going to stretch it out. But anyway, um, but so the next time we get together with, um, with this uh, class, we're going to talk a little bit more about the work of the Holy Spirit and inspiration. But please notice, it is supernatural and it is certainly the work of the Holy Spirit of God, and it's, and it's done, um, it revolves around Scripture. So all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, okay? So it has to do with the Bible. Inspiration does not, uh, does not de uh, and we talked about a little bit about this last week, so revelation is one thing, but that work of getting this truth into a form is the, is the inspiration part. So when we talk about inspiration, we are talking about not so like an inspired concept or an inspired, inspired feeling. I really felt inspired, you know, do such and such a thing. Well, that sounds great, but if it doesn't jive with the Bible, it's not from God, okay? Because the Bible is what's inspired, all right? So, um, so we're talking about the influence of the Holy Spirit upon Scripture writers, which render their writings an accurate record of revelation, okay? Now, uh, his, his definition continues on from there. It has a lot more things to say about it. But um, there are a lot of different definitions. They pretty much all say the same thing. I, I, in my own notes, I wrote down several different ones. Um, when I was going through college, we always used Charles Rory's theology works. And, um, you know, uh, of course, he, was, uh, uh, he taught at uh, Philadelphia College of the Bible for the longest time. I think he was also... Um, at Dallas Theological Seminary uh, for a long time. Uh, his, of course, his background is Presbyterian, so uh, it's, you, know, you, you have to take it for what it's worth when, when you understand where, you know, where he's coming from with his theology. Um, but the only, what I like mostly about Rory's theologies and the things he writes is he's a really plain speaker, and he gets things to where you can understand, that you get your hands around a little bit better. And um, so I'm just reading, I'm reading uh, verbatim his definition of inspiration, God's uh, superintendence of the human authors of the scriptures so that 
using their own individual personalities, they composed and recorded without error his revelation to man in the words of the original autographs. And so the word autograph, of course, is talking about the, um, you know, when, like, for instance, when Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians, it was actually written on a piece of paper, right? Papyrus. He's, it is written down. That's called an autograph. No autographs from the Bible exist today. They're all gone. So what we have is translations that come from copies. We're going to talk about that months from now when we talk about you know, the King James Bible and the translation work and things, all right? So no autographs actually exist. So um, by introducing the subject matter of original autographs, what Rory, of course, opens the door for, which, which we're going to talk about, is the fact that when people do make copies and copies of copies and copies of copies of copies, that errors can be made. So is that, I mean, is that God's fault? So we're going to talk about, we'll talk about that coming up in a couple, couple months from now, all right? But the important thing that I want to emphasize, that, that Rory emphasizes, is the fact of, you, uh, of using their own uh, individual personalities. And that, that's an important concept in understanding of, of inspiration, that God can use all these different authors and yet not put their personality aside. Now, being the fact that I've had an opportunity of, of teaching several classes over the years uh, at, in different places, whether it be here, whether it be Bible Institutes, I've taught high school, I've taught other, um, uh, in, in other places too. I, was, I, I taught um, for a little while at Burlington County College, I taught an ESL class. It's, it's amazing. Once you learn how to speak English, you can help people speak English. Yeah? I ain't kidding, okay? I was helping people speak English, all right? You didn't get the joke there. All right, anyway, I, I, I often ask people to write papers. I, I just, I love doing that. I, I think you can, you can understand more about what people know if you ask them to write things down. And so in doing so, I began to develop an understanding of different writing styles and how people communicate by writing. And you know what I've determined? Everybody's different in the way that they communicate. And so, you know, there were some students I had over at uh, Lehigh Valley. I just loved reading their papers. And it, it was kind of like it just flowed. And it was, you know, great writing style, wonderful vocabulary. Everything was perfect. And then there was always, you know, a student or two that when the assignments come in, I'm thinking, all right, do I put that on the top of the pile and just deal with it? Or do I save this one for last, okay? Because I don't want to ruin the rest of my day, you know? And uh, there are always students like that because everybody is different. So is it that way in the Bible? You know, um, people like, um, uh, like the Apostle John, he was a fisherman, okay? Peter was a fisherman. They were unlearned. They, they, and then you get somebody like, of course, the Apostle Paul, who was a trained Pharisee. He, he, went, he went to Pharisee school, well-educated. He could, he could put, I mean, you read his epistles, and you can see how he had, a, he had a theme he wanted to deal with. He starts at the beginning of Romans, and he builds this tremendous argument about how all men are, are, are lost and he builds this tremendous argument with it, and then, boom, makes the big point, okay? Um, and then you have somebody like Luke, who was, who was not Jewish. He was a Gentile, and he was well-educated. He, he was professional. He was a doctor. And, and you can tell, I mean, like right out of the gate, you could tell he was a historian. And he comes right out and says, you know, I have sat down to put this thing together, and I've drawn all these eyewitnesses in, and I'm going to relay this to you, and boom, 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 boom. Gives all these great details, medical details about the crucifixion and other things. He's a tremendous historian. Every book of the Bible is, is that way in the fact that it's unique in its character. So there's a lot of folks that, that would, you know, that have, you know, issues against you know, inspiration that would say, well, if, you know, if, if it was truly inspired, then you wouldn't have that type of diversity. 
Um, and I, you know, to me, it's a greater, um, it is, is a greater understanding of the ability and the power of God to give us truth when he can do it in that way through the diversity of all the authors and yet not lacking in its character theologically, not having any, any type of contradiction when you can span thousands of years and, you know, 30-plus authors and still walk away and say it all flows, it all meshes together completely. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful testimony of the power of God in relaying his word. Now, this morning, excuse me, this afternoon, um, you know, we're, I want to talk a little bit. I, this, uh, that's one of the definitions. Um, another uh, uh, favorite author of mine is uh, Lewis Sperry Schaefer. Schaefer was the uh, dean of theology down at, um, he might have been the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. I believe he was. Uh, this is going way back. Uh, the human authors wrote um, as moved by the Holy Spirit so that without wavering, um, excuse me, without waiving their human intelligence, their vocabulary, their personal feelings, their literary styles, um, their personalities, their involvement, um, environmental influences, okay? Um, so that's why, you know, you'll see Paul the Apostle making all kinds of references to the things he was extremely familiar with, things like sporting events, things like um, occupying uh, armies, uh, he makes a lot of military references because he lived in an occupied territory, okay? You'll, you'll see Paul doing things like that. Um, so environmental influences or their own individuality, they recorded God's complete and uh, connected message to man with perfect accuracy in the original languages of Scripture and the, the very words bearing the authority of divine authorship. This is known as the verbal plenary view of Scripture. We're going to talk about those terms next time, okay? Those terms verbal and plenary. And um, I do hold to a verbal plenary uh, work of inspiration, and we'll, we'll talk about those terms, okay? What I want to speak about this afternoon are, are some of the alternative views that so often people hold to, okay? And um, the first, and you, you'll see there, this is not a complete list. I think one of the lists I saw had about seven or eight different ones on there. I kind of kind of clumped them, a few of them together a little bit. But then the first one is, and okay, so, uh, so somebody in a maybe a liberal church will say, well, we believe in inspiration. Well, you kind of have to ask them, what do you mean by inspiration? And so natural inspiration is the understanding that the word of God is inspired just like, for instance, like Shakespeare was inspired to write, you know, his works. So there was this kind of like the stirring with inside of him that said, you know, what light through yonder window breaks? Tis the east, and Juliet is the sun, okay? I mean, what you can talk about inspired stuff, you know? Or, you know, some poet, uh, Joyce Kilmer, all right? How many of you Jersey folks know who Joyce Kilmer is? Sounds familiar. Well, first of all, Joyce Kilmer is a guy, not a gal, all right? All right? We all know that, right? I forget his first name. That's actually Joyce's his middle name. And, uh, and so he was a poet. Anybody know his most famous poet, poem? Anybody? Oh, come on. He's a, he was born in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And... He is so important that he has a New Jersey Turnpike rest area named after him. Come on, that's how you know him. Brother, <laughs> Brother Manny, I knew you had some culture about you. Oh, yeah, he's a rest area. Yes, he is, man. So next time you pull in there, when you go in the foyer, there's the plaque. Read the plaque, okay? All right. Um, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. That's the first line of, of one of his most famous poems, of course. And um, um, he, um, he was actually killed during World War I. He was shot and killed uh, in France. Uh, sniper's bullet took him right out. And uh, he was only in his, uh, I guess he was in his early 30s uh, when he died. Uh, and, you know, uh, so his poems, of course, were still around. And, and the tree, I remember the first time ever hearing that poem when I was a child. And, and I, I heard it. How many of you remember Rocky and Bullwinkle? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Brother, are you, you're not old enough for Rocky. You got the reruns. You, okay. Amen. 
So, uh, but they always had like a, like a poem, uh, like a, uh, you know, little poem thing that they did or, you know, cultural thing. And, uh, of course, you know, Bullwinkle reading it sounds a little different, you know. I think that I would never see a poem as lovely as a tree. What do you think, Rocky? You know? Um, so I, I remember hearing that as a child and then finding out it was actually a real poem. So natural inspiration takes God's word and brings it down to that level that someone had, you know, this, this kind of a stirring inside of them and began to pen the words that were kind of laid on their heart. And so it becomes, you know, basically it becomes the work of men. It's like a divine spark that burns with inside of them. They felt compelled to write something, all right? So there's, there are some that hold to this idea of a natural inspiration. The second is, uh, is mechanical inspiration, okay? What do, you, what do you think we mean by that, mechanical inspiration, okay? What do you, what do you think? What thinkest thou? What do you think, Rocky? Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So it's more like a dictation. It's like God dictated, and they're just, uh, you know, whether it be in some kind of trance or whatever, they're just, they're just mechanically writing down what exactly God has uh, given them. The author is simply a secretary just taking notations from God. And that's, that's, a, that's one of those theories that, that folks put out there. Um, uh, and so, you know, um, there, I mean, there are some places in the scripture where, you know, uh, where you see, you know, God saying, you know, write these things in a book. And I don't have a problem with that. I mean, there were some things like, you know, Jeremiah, he's like, okay, Lord, let me get this down. So there was a lot of things. But, you know, what you, what you end up with is, is asking yourself then the question, you know, here we're talking about the book of Jeremiah. I spoke about it quite a bit last week. The book of Jeremiah, there's a uh, there's great variety of, of both, you know, here, just here, thus saith the Lord, and he has these things written down. And then there's historical accounts, and there are other things that are in there. There are comments by Jeremiah, comments written down by others that are, that are spoken to him. You go to the book of Isaiah, you have the same exact thing. You go to other portions of Scripture. Like, for instance, you know, you go to, you, you go to the book of Esther, the book of Esther honestly makes no mention uh, really of, of anything, um, uh, no mention really of God that's in there. Uh, the book of Esther is a very unique book. Um, and, and so there, there is no, there's no prophecy really that's given. It's a historical account of an event. Um, and so you would look at that and say, is it inspired? And there are folks that actually, you know, going way back, but they would have questioned um, the value of the book of Esther as being an inspired book because there's no thus saith the Lord's in it, okay? So is it inspired? And so when you talk about mechanical dictation, you would say, well, I, I got no problem with that in reference to when God said to Jeremiah, write these things, you know, in a book, and he wrote them in a book. Um, he's, he basically is doing dictation, but that is not the limit of the Word of God. That's not all that the Bible has. Yes, sir? Uh -huh. A lot of times when you think you've got God in a box, you've got to figure out, he breaks out of the box and does something completely different. Amen to that. And, like yeah. We were talking about those scriptures where they, when they, they were reading to the king, the king got mm -hmm. upset, had him destroyed. They said they wrote every word again, then he added more words to yeah. that. And yeah, so, that's... You know, uh, it's, God always, he's not confined in a yeah, box. Yeah, he is certainly, yeah, you can't put him in a box, that's for sure. And, and so you have, you have a, this, this book is composed of more than just dictations. But there, there is a side, that, that, and when I say mechanical inspiration, I'm talking about the fact that some people believe that this whole book is a collection of simply uh, words that God gave directly and everything is mechanical from that point, that, the, that every author and everything in this book was mechanically given, okay? A, a third one is a conceptual inspiration, conceptual inspiration. And um, this would be a, a, a very liberal, yes, sir? In terms of mechanical yes, inspiration, sir. it is, it could have been used in certain places, I would say that there are places in the scripture where, where the authors got 
word by word from God exactly what needs to be written. You will find places in the scripture that say that, you know, God, you know, you know, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah and he wrote down exactly what God told him to write down. Now, the, uh, to, uh, a difference that I would hold to is the fact that those that hold to mechanical inspiration would say that, that that individual really didn't even know exactly what they were writing. They were simply being used as an instrument to pen that. And I would say that, that for instance, we're talking about Jeremiah. He is li God's speaking to him, and he's writing down exactly what God's saying to him. So I, you know, that's not mechanical in the, in the fact, but it is a dictation. Okay, mechanical would say that they are that that they really maybe didn't even know exactly what they were writing. They were simply just an instrument. Could have been in a trance. I know I've read some books before where they say that the authors were actually in trances. Uh huh. Some of this just straight up historical right. could have been passed down, let's say. Sure. But some of it definitely, you know, they definitely could not have known. Exactly. Like with creation. So, mm -hmm. during, in that, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a portion of that that kind of almost had to be, not mechanically, but maybe dictated. Yeah. But then there's almost that transition to then now writing, I'll just say, just historical. Just stuff. historical, yeah. And that's. I won't say it goes, the next one is conceptual, I mean, mm -hmm. because conceptual goes to a very slippery slope. Yes, it does, yeah. But, uh, I mean, is there a difference there between uh, the mechanical stuff of, hey, you have no concept of what this is, mm -hmm. here's exactly what you're going to write, yeah. compared to something that they historically went through, Yeah. and uh, I don't know if more of their character goes right. into that stuff? Yeah. So how does how does that how is that done then? Uh, transition between just a dictator, something they never experienced, right. something they did experience, yeah. but obviously not the slippery slope to the next point. Yeah, the, uh, see the the dictation part. I myself I would hold to the fact that by dictation I would say that that whenever you see in the scriptures, not I don't want to just you know this is always the case, but anytime you see in the scriptures and you know we're picking on Jeremiah. When Jeremiah says, you know, when the book says, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah saying, okay, um, and, and he is writing down verbatim. To me, that's, that's uh, you know, I, I would never use the word mechanical, but I would use the word dictation, okay? So, um, but historical accounts, for instance, you know, like the book of Genesis, because uh, Moses would have been the author of the book of Genesis. He would have written those down. Um, a lot of that had been passed around down through oral tra tradition through years, okay? And so when I look at that, I say, well, there was a, definitely a divine intervention in uh, Moses' life so that when he recorded those things, he's not necessarily getting dictation, even recording the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, because he has heard these things, okay? This is oral tradition before there was, you know, before they had... Uh, Things written down. There was oral tradition, and and so, so he's heard these things, and so if he's going to sit down and record them, and, and again, it's it's by the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. So it's not like Moses is sitting around in the desert for forty years, going, "What am I going to do? I might as well write a book," you know. So he's being led by the Spirit of God to do this, and so then the Holy Spirit is going to is is going to control in some capacity what is actually going to be recorded. So it's not, that's not necessarily a dictation. So I would not hold the, you know, the, the, the book of Genesis as a dictated work. I would, I would hold it as a recording of oral tradition, but, um, um, but directed by the Holy Spirit so that it is without error. Okay? As far as the dictation goes, any time that you have, you know, the word of the Lord came unto, and then you see... Exactly. This is what God said. I believe those authors actually received a message verbatim, and they wrote it out exactly what God had said for them to say. Okay, Brother Sean? Yeah, so something like Job, where mm -hmm. you have a story of Satan coming to yep. God. How, that, would that have also been handed down through oral tradition, or how would that yeah. be told to the author? Well, that would... Um, uh, the book of Job, 
would have happened. Uh, he, he was a contemporary of Abraham, okay? So that is, that's, that's way back. That's, yeah, so there, there is oral tradition there. So I would, I would venture to say yes, oral tradition. But um, again, um, the influence of the Holy Spirit of God in order to preserve the accuracy of it. So whether or not the oral tradition was accurate as is going from generation to generation, but whoever penned it would have been accurate because of the Holy Spirit. So even, even that conversation, you know, in heaven and the devils, you know, uh, have, you know, has having that conversation, that still could have been, I'm watching, I'm waiting for the roll. There he goes. I, I, would, I, would, I would venture to say that the oral tradition would have included that, but the accuracy of it is not necessarily preserved in the oral tradition because all scripture is all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the, the work of inspiration would not have taken place until the scriptures were written. So here's, you know, here you have revelation, but over here when the scripture's written, that's when the inspiration work takes place. So who's ever penning um, the book of Job, that is where the work of the Holy Spirit is. So you can pass oral traditions down from you know generation to generation, but that does not that does not um, that does not indicate that they're without error. Oral tradition. The tendency of errors and mm -hmm. inflation of, of things during things being passed down orally. Yeah. And then when it's penned, right. And there's accuracy due to it being scripture. Inspiration, I mean, correct. It must have been a combination of dictation. What's he going to do? Start writing and God be like, hey, no, not that one. <laughs> right. um, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, there must have been some sort of combination of that at some yeah. point. Yeah, but see, I would, and I agree with you. There is a combination of it, all right? There's an observation of historical things, the understanding of the oral tradition, but that is all, that is all controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Okay. See, I would, I would never, um, I, I have no problem with the idea of dictation, but I, I, um, I, I do not hold to a mechanical as far as, you know, just sitting there and spitting out words and not have, really even having an idea what they're writing. Okay. So those that hold to that mechanical viewpoint would tend to go that far, almost like somebody's in a trance and they're just being used as a, as a writing machine. Okay. So um, to me, that is, um, what that does is it, 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 uh, it removes all those things as far as writing style, personality, uh, you know, even as, uh, as um, the, you know, the one, uh, one definition talked about environmental influences. You know, um, you know can God, did God use uh, the experiences that Paul had in his life to flavor the epistles that he wrote? Well, it certainly has, but yet within the confines of inspiration. So God used that in order to, you know, in order to provide all these great things. And, and so even as you get to the end of the book of, of, uh, of the Pentateuch, and of course Moses wrote the Pentateuch, and then you get in the book of Deuteronomy, and, and you, you have this beautiful combination where, where you know, Moses is standing up and saying, well, this is what the Lord told us, and he's going through all these things. You know? If you, you do this, you'll be blessed, you'll be blessed. If you do this, you'll be cursed, you'll be cursed. He's going through all this. And then he begins to talk about his own experiences and what he's, you know, what he's dealt with, and, uh, and then be really begins as, you know, as a, you know, really a, a shepherd for these people, encouraging them to you know, follow God and to be faithful and all this stuff, and so you have this this I mean, it's just beautifully blended together. But if you if you believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, then you do have that blend, Tom, that you're talking about. You have that beautiful blend of oral tradition, uh, of experience, and also this verbatim of, if you would, dictation from God. God, this is what God said, and it's all recorded and blended together seamlessly. And, and that's the, and the key is without error because it's under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Brother Denny? Well, uh, when Moses was going through the desert and, and, and they, they just were doing, you know, so many wicked things. God had it up to here with them. Uh -huh. and, uh, and God said, guess what, Moses? I'm going to destroy them all. Yeah. 
I'm going to destroy them all. Start over with you. Yeah. And what What did Moses do? He begged God. Sure. And that was all pen. Like, yeah. Who wrote the fight? That's sort of like Moses writing. You know what I'm saying? Well, it is. It is. You know? And so, yeah, Moses is recording that. Yeah. 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 I don't know. There's things in the Bible where you know, can God be persuaded in a different way? And yeah. He's still getting penned. Yeah. Word. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It seems like it's pretty incredible. That yeah, what, what's, what's incredible? Brother, along that same line, what's incredible to me is when you do see places in the scripture where it talks about the Lord repenting. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. It's it's a it's a it's a word you would never think to use with God, um, but yet, um, but you'll see it several times in Scripture. Repent of the Lord. Well, I think the first time you see it, you see it in the Book of Genesis in reference to the flood. You know, they repented of the Lord that He had made man upon the earth, and 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 so what you um, and I always view that as a, the, kind of like a turning of a coin. You know, because God is God is holy, and so He must be just. But God is also love, and so He's merciful. And so I've always viewed that as saying, hey, you know, at one time, you know, God's extending mercy, but then He, because He's, because not only is He is He God of love, but He's also a holy God. I always view that and say, well, then God has to kind of, if you would, flip the coin over, okay? Because there some, comes a certain point where God's justice. And judgment has to be exercised. And so, but yeah, those type of things are recorded in Scripture. And, uh, and it's, um, you know, all the, all the ugly things that take place, um, they, they are not hidden in the Word of God. God puts it all out there. All the good stuff and all the ugly stuff. And uh, as compared to, you know, like the chronicles of many empires, you know, where the, the king only puts the good stuff up there. You know, they're only going to carve the victories on the walls of their, of their, of their, of their, of their, uh, of their uh, castles, you know. They're not going to carve the defeats. But in the word of God, you get the full spectrum. You get the whole thing. God doesn't hold anything back. So, um, you know, I, I want to I at least get this last one in here and because uh, we're running out of time, but... Um, uh, that, that partial inspiration, I think you get kind of get the, uh, the I, did, I didn't even mention about conceptual. I think you understand what conceptual is, that, that the main ideas are inspired, uh, yet, um, yet not, the, not the entire text. You get the idea? For, it's like, for instance, people that believe in partial inspiration, do you believe that God created the heavens and the earth? Okay, that would be an inspired um, theme or inspired truth. Now, all the details... Okay? People that hold to a partial inspiration may not hold to all the details in the scriptures. So, for instance, you, may, you, you take the first uh, six chapters of the book of Genesis and you say, well, I, you know, sure, I, I, believe that, that, that I believe in a creator God. And that is a, that's, an, that's an inspired concept. But was it through um, six-day creation? Well, you know, we all know... <laughs> that, you know, God could have used many other means, and this is just the way that the authors expressed how, you know, um, you know how it's, just the, it's an expression of the concept. And, and so it could have been, you know, millions of years of evolution, and yet God superseded in bringing about this, you know, race that we had. And so you have the idea, and there's a lot of Christians that hold to a theistic evolution. That's what I was taught uh, in, the Roman, in the Roman Catholic um, uh, Church, going through, uh, you know, of course, I went through Catholic school, 12 years of Catholic education, right? And I came out of that believing in theistic evolution. So you can't open up your Bible and, and say, well okay, is this theistic evolution unless you believe in an inspiration that is conceptual and not verbally and plenary? Okay, we'll talk about those terms uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but that is, that's where a lot of people are at. And I'm not just talking about Catholic church. I'm talking about many people that are in a lot of evangelical churches and even some Baptist churches hold to that. So 
um, conceptual inspiration is this idea that, you know, on the, the underlying concepts are from God, that everything else is built upon that, and they are, you know, you, basically human invention, a way of expressing those concepts in ways that we understand them. Of course, the partial one, I th uh, that's kind of almost self-explanatory, but not, not the whole Bible's inspired, okay? So, for instance, and, and, you know, as Tom was asking about, you know, dictation and stuff, you know, thus saith the Lord. You know, the Lord said unto, you know, Isaiah, and then you have this, you know, this is what God said. All right, but then you have this historic account afterwards. Because, you know, Jeremiah, he's been preaching, and people are sick of him preaching, so they arrest him, and they throw him in jail, stick him in a dungeon, and, you know, he's, you know, up to, up to his elbows in muck and mire. All right, great stuff, all right? And you get all these numbers and battles and folks dying and all these things and hunt tens of thousands and, you know, well, okay. Those that hold the partial inspiration say, well, anywhere where it's, you know, God speaking, thus saith the Lord, that's inspired, but everything else is not. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson, of course, uh, uh, third president of the United States, all right. Um, as a matter of fact, I have his Bible in my office. It's called the Jefferson Bible. It's still in publication today, by the way, all right? And um, um, he, um, he had a very different view of things like inspiration, okay? And so he didn't, he didn't believe in miracles. But he had no problem believing in the words of Jesus Christ. And so I'm not saying that he was a partial inspirationalist, but I would say this, that Thomas Jefferson would have no, I, no problem of saying, well, if Jesus said these things, then it's from God. But the rest of the Gospels are historical accounts written by the apostles, and so they're not necessarily inspired. It's just their observation of what they saw. And so Jefferson had, had real issues with, with miracles, okay? So the miracles were just the way that the apostles perceived things. And so they're just recording their perception of events. And so here you have a partial inspiration. And there's a lot of folks that hold to these type of things. You know, it's kind of like when you open your Bible and you got your red letter edition in your New Testament. Well, you know, it's like I hold to the red letter stuff, but anything written in black is up for fair game. It's that kind of, that kind of idea. So these are, and I pulled these out, and I want to, just wanted to present them because these are not like really bizarre theories that are way out there. This kind of stuff exists in many churches today. These are different viewpoints of what inspiration is. And, you know, what it does is, it, you know, like for instance with the, with the natural inspiration, it just it brings the word of God down to a very low level of saying that it's just the stirrings of mankind. Or what it does also is it, 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 it brings the word of God into question. You know, what exactly can we trust? When I, when I open my Bible, can I just, you know, put my finger anywhere and say, this is from God? Because what happens with all these other theories is that you, you have this understanding that this may not be the truth. And so... Um, the, um, the Bible itself either contains the Word of God or the Bible is the Word of God. And so many of these theories of inspiration, they would have a Bible that only contains the Word of God. And, and, I, and I hold to the fact that that is incorrect. Right? We're out of time. I got a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to talk about with this, and we're going to pick it up a couple weeks from now. But um, Lord bless you. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the uh, the uh, back and forth there. I, I really pre I do I do enjoy that actually. But uh, Lord bless you and thank you, thank you for being in Sunday school today. Amen.